explore the darkest corners of criminal history. Today we will delve into the intriguing story of Sada Abe, a Japanese assassin who starred in one of the most shocking crimes of the 20th century. Join us on this journey through the macabre details of her life and the horrifying events that led her to commit such a disturbing act. Get ready to enter the mind of a murderer and discover the secrets that surround this disturbing case. Let's start our journey through the crime library with the story of Sada Abe. Classification, Killer Characteristics, Erotically suffocates her lover and cuts off his penis and testicles. Number of Victims 1. Date of Crime, May 18, 1936 Date of Arrest, May 21, 1936 Date of Birth, May 28, 1905 Victim Profile, Kichizo Ishida, 42, her lover of hers Crime Method, Strangulation Location, Tokyo, Japan Status Sentenced to six years in prison on December 21, 1936. Released on May 17, 1941. She died after 1970. Sada Abe, May 28, 1905, after 1970, was a Japanese woman remembered for erotically and sexually asphyxiating her lover, Kichizo Ishida, on May 18, 1936, and then cutting off his penis and testicles. To carry with you in your bag, the story became a national sensation in Japan, taking on mythical overtones, and has since been interpreted by artists, philosophers, novelists, and filmmakers. Family Background Sada Abe was the seventh of eight children born to Shigyoshi and Katsu Abe, an upper-middle-class family that made tatami mats in the Kanda Ward of Tokyo. Only four of the Abe family's children survived to adulthood, and of them, Sada was the youngest. Abe's father, Shigyoshi Abe, was originally from Chiba Prefecture. He had been adopted into the Abe family to help run the business, which he eventually inherited. Aged 52 at the time of Sada's birth, police described him as, an honest and upright man, who had no conspicuous vices, although some acquaintances considered him somewhat selfish and with a taste for extravagance. Sada's mother, Katsu Abe, also had no known history of legal or moral blemishes in her record. However, Sada's siblings and her father engaged in questionable behavior. Her brother Shintaro was known to be a womanizer and after they got married, he ran away with his parents' money. Sada's sister, Teruko, is also known to have had several lovers. Her father sent her to work in a brothel, a not unusual way of punishing female sexual promiscuity in Japan at the time, though he soon won her back. Teruko's past was not considered an obstacle to marriage for those of the Abe class at the time, and she soon married herself. Early Life Sada Abe was born in 1905. Her mother doted on her youngest daughter and let her do what she wanted. She encouraged Abe to take singing lessons and play the shamisen, both activities that, at the time, were more closely associated with geisha and prostitutes than classical artistic endeavor. Geisha were considered glamorous celebrities, and Abe herself followed the image of her skipping school for these lessons and wearing fancy makeup. As family problems over his siblings, sister Teruko and brother Shintaro, became more pressing, Abe was often thrown out of the house alone. He soon found himself with a group of equally independent teenagers. At the age of 15, during one of these outings, she was raped by one of her acquaintances, and although her parents defended and supported her, she became a difficult teenager. As she became more irresponsible and uncontrollable, her parents sold her to a geisha house in Yokohama in 1922, hoping to find her a place in society with some direction. Toku Abe, Sada's older sister, testified that she wished to become a geisha. Sada herself, however, claimed that her father turned her into a geisha as punishment for her promiscuity. Abe's encounter with the geisha world proved frustrating and disappointing. Becoming a true star among the geisha required an apprenticeship from childhood with years spent studying the arts and music. 
Abe ended up being a low-ranking geisha, where her main duties were to provide sex. She worked for five years in this capacity and eventually contracted syphilis. Since this meant that she would have to undergo regular examinations, like a legally licensed prostitute, she Abe decided to enter that higher paying profession. Early 1930s Abe began working as a prostitute in Osaka's notorious Tabita brothel district, but soon gained a reputation as a troublemaker. She stole money from clients and tried to get out of the brothel several times, but she was tracked down by the well-organized legal prostitution system. After two years, she finally managed to escape the licensed prostitution system and started working as a waitress. However, not satisfied with her salary, she soon returned to working as a prostitute, although now without a license. She began working in Osaka's unlicensed brothels in 1932. Abe's mother died in January 1933, and Abe went to Tokyo to visit her father and her mother's grave. She entered the prostitution market in Tokyo and became a lover there for the first time. When her father fell seriously ill in January 1934, Abe nursed him for 10 days until his death. In October 1934, Abe was arrested in a police raid on the unlicensed brothel where she worked. Kinesuk Kasahara, a well-connected friend of the brothel owner, arranged for the women's release. He was attracted to Abe and, discovering that she was debt-free, and with Abe's consent, he made her her lover. Kasahara set up a house for Abe on December 20, 1934, and provided him with money. In his statement to police, he recalled, she was really strong, really powerful. Even though I'm pretty jaded, it was enough to shock me. She wasn't satisfied unless we did it two, three, or four times a night. To her, it was unacceptable unless I had my hand on her private parts all night. At first it was great, but after a couple of weeks I got a little tired. When Abe suggested that Kasahara leave her wife to marry her, he refused. She then asked Kasahara to let her have a lover, which he also refused to do. After that, their relationship ended, and to escape from him, Abe went to Nagoya. Kasahara ended her testimony with an angry comment about Abe, she is a whore and a prostitute. And as what she has done makes clear, she is a woman men should fear. Similarly, Abe recalled Kasahara in less than flattering terms, saying, he didn't love me and treated me like an animal. He was the kind of scum who would later beg me when he said we should break up. In Nagoya in 1935, again intent on leaving the sex industry, Abe began working as a maid in a restaurant. She soon became romantically involved with a restaurant patron, Goro Omiya, a professor and banker who aspired to become a member of the Diet of Japan. Knowing that the restaurant would not tolerate a maid having sex with customers and bored with Nagoya, she returned to Tokyo in June. Omiya met Abe in Tokyo and, discovering that he had contracted syphilis, paid for his stay at a hot spring resort in Kusatsu from November to January 1936. In January, Omiya suggested that Abe could become financially independent by opening a small restaurant and recommended to start working as an apprentice in said business. Meet Kichizo Ishida Back in Tokyo, Abe began working as an apprentice at Yoshidaya on February 1, 1936. The owner of this establishment, Kichizo Ishida, 42 at the time, had worked his way up in the business, starting out as an apprentice in a restaurant. Of Eels He had opened the Yoshidaya in Tokyo's Nakano Ward in 1920. By the time Abe joined his restaurant, Ishida was known as a womanizer who did little to run the restaurant, which was run mainly by his wife. Not long after she started working at Yoshidaya, Ishida started making advances towards Abe. Omiya had never satisfied Abe sexually and he gave himself to Ishida. In mid-April, Ishida and Abe began their sexual relationship at the restaurant, to the accompaniment of a romantic ballad sung by one of the restaurant's geisha. On April 23, 
1936, Abe and Ishida met for a prearranged sexual encounter at a tea house or machiai, the contemporary equivalent of a love hotel, in the Shibuya neighborhood. Planning only a brief fling, the couple stayed in bed for four days. On the night of April 27, 1936, they moved to another tea house in the distant Futako Tamagawa neighborhood. Here they continued to drink and have sex, sometimes to the accompaniment of a geisha's singing. They would continue even when the maidens entered the room to serve sake. They then moved their lovemaking marathon to Ogu's neighborhood. Ishida did not return to the restaurant until the morning of May 8, 1936. Of Ishida, Abe later said, it is difficult to say exactly what was good about Ishida. But it was impossible to say anything bad about his appearance, his attitude, his skill as a lover, the way he expressed his feelings. I've never met such a sexy man. After they broke up, Abe became agitated and began drinking heavily. He claimed that with Ishida he knew love for the first time in his life, and the idea that Ishida was back with his wife made her jealous. More than a week before the murder, Abe began to consider the act. On May 9, 1936, he attended a play in which a geisha attacks her lover with a large knife. After seeing this, Abe decided to threaten Ishida with a knife at her next meeting. On May 11, 1936, he pawned some of his clothes and used the money to buy sushi and a kitchen knife. Abe later described meeting Ishida that night, I took the kitchen knife out of my bag and threatened him as had been done in the play I had seen, saying, Kichi, you wore that kimono just to please one of your favorite customers. Bastard, I'll kill you for that. Ishida was startled and moved away a bit, but he seemed delighted with everything. Abe Sada Incident Ishida and Abe returned to Ogu, where they stayed until their deaths. This time, while they were making love, Abe placed the knife at the base of Ishida's penis and said that she would make sure that he never played with another woman. Ishida laughed at this. Two nights after this episode of sex, Abe began to choke Ishida and told him to continue, saying that this increased her pleasure. She made him do it to her too. On the afternoon of May 16, 1936, Abe used his obi sash to cut off Ishida's breath during his orgasm, which they both enjoyed. They repeated this for two more hours. Once Abe stopped the strangulation, Ishida's face became distorted and she did not return to her normal appearance. Ishida took 30 tablets of a sedative called Kalmatin to try to ease her pain. According to Abe, when Ishida began to doze off, he told her, you will put the cord around my neck and tighten it again while I sleep, right? If you start strangling me, don't stop, because it's very painful afterwards. Abe commented that she wondered if he had wanted her to kill him, but on reflection he decided that he must be joking. At about 2 a.m. M. On the morning of May 18, 1936, while Ishida was sleeping, Abe wrapped her sash twice around her neck and strangled him to death. He later told the police, after I had killed Ishida, I felt completely calm, as if a heavy load had been lifted from my shoulders, and I felt a sense of clarity. After sleeping with Ishida's body for a few hours, she cut off her genitals with the kitchen knife, wrapped them in a magazine cover, and kept them until her arrest three days later. She with the blood she wrote Sada, Kichi Futari Kiri, Sada, Kichi together, on Ishida's left thigh and on a sheet. She then carved, Sada, the character of her name, into her left arm. After putting on Ishida's underwear, she left the inn around 8 a.m. and told the staff not to bother Ishida. When she was asked why she had cut off Ishida's genitals, Abe replied, because I couldn't take his head or his body. I wanted to take the part of him that brought back the most vivid memories. After leaving the inn, Abe met Goro Omiya. She repeatedly apologized to him, but Omiya, unaware of the murder, assumed that she was apologizing for taking another lover. Abe's apology was for the damage to her political career that she knew his association with her would cause. On May 19, 1936, 
the newspapers picked up the story. Omiya's career was ruined, and Abe's life was under intense public scrutiny from then on. Abe sat a panic. The story immediately became a national sensation, and the frenzy that followed the search for him was dubbed the Abe Sata Panic. Police received reports of sightings of Abe from several cities, and one false sighting almost led to a stampede in Ginza, causing a major traffic jam. In a reference to the recent failed coup in Tokyo, the Nai and Iroku incident, 26-2, or February 26, the crime was satirically dubbed the Goichihachi incident, 5-18 or May 18th. On May 19th, 1936, Abe went shopping and saw a movie. He stayed at an inn in Shinagawa on May 20th, where he received a massage and drank three bottles of beer. He spent the day writing farewell letters to Omiya, a friend, and Ishida. He planned to commit suicide a week after the murder and practiced necrophilia. I felt attached to Ishida's penis and thought that only after silently saying goodbye to him could I die. I unwrapped the paper that held them and looked at his penis and scrolled him. I put his penis in my mouth and even tried to insert it inside myself. However, it didn't work, though I kept trying and trying, then, I decided that I would run away to Osaka, keeping Ishida's penis the whole time that I in the end. I would jump off a cliff on Mount Ikoma while holding on to his penis. At 4 p.m., police detectives, suspicious of the alias Abe had registered under, arrived at his room. Don't be so formal, he told them, you're looking for Sada Abe, right? Well, that's me. I'm Sada Abe. When the police were not convinced, he showed Ishida's genitals as evidence. Abe was arrested and interrogated for eight sessions. The interrogating officer was shocked by Abe's behavior when asked why he had killed Ishida. He immediately got excited and his eyes sparkled in a strange way. His answer was, I loved him so much that I wanted him just for myself. But since we were not husband and wife, as long as he lived, he could be embraced by other women. I knew that if I killed him, no other woman could ever touch him again, so I I killed. In attempting to explain what distinguished Abe's case from more than a dozen similar cases in Japan, William Johnston suggests that it is this response that captured the nation's imagination. She hadn't killed out of jealousy but out of love. Mark Schreiber points out that the Sada Abe incident occurred at a time when the Japanese media was preoccupied with extreme political and military issues, including the NINI Roku incident and a looming full-scale war in China. He suggests that a sensationalized sex scandal like this served as a welcome national liberation from the disturbing events of the time. The incident also struck a chord with the Erodurana and Sensu, erotic grotesque nonsense, style popular at the time, and the Sada Abe incident came to represent that genre for years to come. As the details of the crime became public, rumors began to circulate that Ishida's penis was of extraordinary size, however, the police officer who questioned Abe after his arrest denied this, saying, Ishida's was just average. Abe, told me, size doesn't make a man in bed. The technique and his desire to please myself was what I liked about Ishida. After his arrest, Ishida's penis and testicles were transferred to the Pathology Museum of the Tokyo University School of Medicine. They were put on public display shortly after the end of World War II, but have since disappeared. Conviction and Sentence The first day of Abe's trial was November 25, 1936, and by 5 a.m. crowds were already gathering to attend. The judge presiding over the trial admitted to being sexually aroused by some of the details involved in the case, but made sure that the trial was conducted in the utmost seriousness. Abe's statement before receiving the sentence began, What I regret the most about this incident is that I have come to be misunderstood as some kind of sexual pervert. There has never been a man in my life like Ishida. There were men who I liked them and slept with them without accepting money, but none of them made me feel what I felt for him. On December 21, 
1936, Abe was convicted of second-degree murder and mutilation of a corpse. Although the prosecution called for 10 years and Abe claimed that she wanted the death penalty, she was actually sentenced to only six years in prison. She was committed to the Tachijai Women's Penitentiary, where she was the 11th prisoner. Abe's sentence was commuted on November 10, 1940, on the occasion of the celebrations of the 2600th anniversary of the mythical founding of Japan, when Emperor Jimmu ascended the throne. She was released, exactly five years after the murder, on May 17, 1941. The police record of Abe's interrogation and confession became a national bestseller in 1936. Christine L. Marin places the national fascination with the Abe story in the context of the dokufu, or poison woman, stereotype, a type of character female transgressor who had first become popular in Japanese serialized novels and plays in the 1870s. In the wake of popular, poison woman, literature, confessional autobiographies of female criminals began to appear in the late 1890s. In the early 1910s, autobiographical writings by female criminals took on an unapologetic tone, and sometimes included criticism of Japan and Japanese society. Kano Suga, who was hanged in 1911 for plotting to assassinate Emperor Meiji in what became known as the High Treason Incident, wrote openly rebellious essays while in prison. Fumiko Kaneko, who was sentenced to death for plotting to bomb the imperial family, used her notoriety to speak out against the imperial system and the racism and paternalism she said she engendered. Abe's confession, in the years since it appeared, became the most widely circulated female crime narrative in Japan. Marin points out that Abe, unlike previous criminal autobiographers, later life. Upon his release from prison, Abe assumed an alias. As the lover of a serious man, whom she refers to in her memoirs as Y, she first moved to Ibaraki Prefecture and then to Saitama Prefecture. When Y's friends and family learned Abe's true identity, she broke off her relationship. Wishing to divert public attention from politics and criticism of the occupation authorities, the Yoshida government openly encouraged a 3S policy, sports, screen, and sex. This change from the strict pre-war censorship of materials labeled obscene or immoral helped enable a change in tone in the literature on Abe. Pre-war writings such as the psychological diagnosis of Abe Sada, 1937, portray Abe as an example of the dangers of unbridled female sexuality and as a threat to the patriarchal system. In the post-war era, she was treated as a critic of totalitarianism and a symbol of freedom from oppressive political ideologies. Abe became a popular subject in both high and low quality literature. Buraiha writer Oda Sukunasuk wrote two stories based on Abe, and a June 1949 article noted that Abe had recently tried to clear her name after it had been used in a mountain of erotic books. In 1946, the writer Engo Sakaguchi interviewed Abe and treated her as an authority on both sexuality and freedom. Sakaguchi called Abe a warm and tender figure of salvation for future generations. In 1947 the erotic confessions of Abe Sadas became a national bestseller, with more than 100,000 copies sold. The book was in the form of an interview with Sada Abe, but was actually based on police interrogation records. Angry at her implying that the book was based on interviews he had done with her, Abe sued the author, Ichiro Kimura, for libel and defamation of character. The outcome of the lawsuit is unknown, but it is assumed that it was settled out of court. In response to this book, Abe wrote his own autobiography, Memoirs of Abe Sada. In contrast to Kimura's description of her as a pervert, she emphasized her love for Ishida. The first issue of True Story, Jitsawa, magazine, in January 1948, featured unpublished photos of the incident under the headline, Eroguro of the Century. First Public Release Photograph of the Incident by Abe Sada Reflecting the change in tone in her writing about Abe, the June 1949 issue of Monthly Reader calls her a heroine of that age, 
for following her own wishes in a time of false morality and oppression. Abe capitalized on her notoriety by sitting down for an interview in a popular magazine and appearing for several years in a traveling stage production called Showa Ikadai Anna, the woman of the Showa period. In 1952 she began working at Hashikikusui, a working-class pub in Inari-cho, in central Tokyo. She lived a low-key life in Tokyo's Shitai Award for the next 20 years, and was awarded a Model Employee Award by her neighborhood restaurant association. More than once, during the 1960s, the film critic Donald Ritchie visited the Hashikikusui. In his collection of profiles, Japanese portraits, he describes Abe making a dramatic entrance into a boisterous group of drinkers. She slowly descended a long staircase that led to the center of the crowd, fixing a haughty gaze on the people in her audience. The men in the pub would respond by putting their hands over their crotches and yelling things like, hide the knives, and I'm afraid to go pee. Abe would bang on the railing in anger and stare at the crowd in awkward, complete silence, and only then would he continue her entrance, chatting and serving drinks from table to table. Richie comments, he had actually strangled a man to death and then severed his limb. There was a consequent chill as Sada Abe slapped you on the back. In 1969, Abe appeared in the Sada Abe Incident section of the dramatized documentary history of bizarre crimes by women in the Meiji Teisho and Showa eras, Meiji Teisho Showa Ryoki Ana Hanzeshi, by director Teruo Ishii, and the last known photograph of Abe was taken. In August of that year, he disappeared from public view for good in 1970. When the film In the Realm of the Senses was being planned in the mid-1970s, director Nagisa Oshima apparently sought out Abe and, after a long search, he found her, with her hair cropped, in a Kansai nunnery. Legacy Decades after the incident and his disappearance, Sada Abe continues to attract public interest. In addition to the documentary in which Abe herself appeared shortly before she disappeared from the public eye, at least three successful films have been made based on the story. The 1983 film, Sexy Doll, Abe Sada Sansei, used Abe's name in the title. In 1998, a 438-page biography of Abe was published in Japan, and in 2005 the first comprehensive book on Abe in English was published, Geisha, Harlot, Strangler, Star, A Woman, Sex, and Morality in Modern Japan by William Johnston. The Japanese noise musician Merzbau adopted the alias Abe Sada for one of his early musical projects. He released only one record under this name, the 1994 7-inch original Body Kingdom slash Gala Abe Sada 1936. In March 2007, a four-bass noise band from Perth, Western Australia called Abe Sada won an Australian Department of Culture and Arts Contemporary Music Scholarship to tour Japan in June and July 2007. The Abe Sada Incident On May 18, 1936, Sada Abe strangled her lover, Kichizo Ishida, to death. After lying with the body for several hours, she took a kitchen knife and cut off his genitals. Wrapping them in a magazine cover, he used her blood to write Sada, Kichi Futari Kiri, Sada, Kichi together, on her left thigh and on a sheet. He then carved her name on his left arm, dressed, and left the room in the Tokyo Inn where they had stayed. Sada ordered the staff not to disturb Ishida and left the inn. Soon after, she went to see a politically prominent ex-lover, Goro Amaya, and apologized to him repeatedly. He had no idea what she was talking about, but she was well aware that her career was about to be ruined by adverse publicity due to her relationship with him. She was right. Born into a wealthy Tokyo family in 1905, Sada Abe, or Abe Sada depending on the naming tradition used, was doted on by her mother, who encouraged her to be independent and free-spirited. At 15, she was raped by an acquaintance. Although her parents supported her during the investigation that followed, Sada was never the same again. As she became more uncontrollable, her father sold her to a geisha house in Yokohama, 
though family members would later disagree on why. While Sada maintained that she was being punished for her promiscuous behavior, her sister claimed that she had been perfectly willing. Becoming an accomplished geisha was a mark of distinction for Japanese women of the time, and Sada had often expressed her desire to pursue this lifestyle. Whatever Sada's ideas of the glamorous life of a geisha were, the reality was very different. After contracting syphilis from a client, she turned to prostitution and began working in Osaka's brothel district. Working as a licensed prostitute posed more problems than she was prepared to deal with and she eventually drifted into unlicensed prostitution, with all the usual dangers. After the death of her parents, she became even more riotous. A raid on the brothel where she worked in 1934 led to her becoming the mistress of a well-connected friend of the brothel owner. A series of other lovers followed her as she tried to get out of prostitution entirely. In 1936, Sada became an apprentice at a restaurant in an attempt to start a new life. That was how she met Kichizo Ishida. Despite being the owner of the Yoshidaya restaurant where Sada worked, it was actually his wife who ran the business. Ishida, 42, was a frequent womanizer who was bored with his marriage and it didn't take long for him to notice his free-spirited apprentice. Sada for her part, even though she was already involved with Omiya at the time, she didn't hesitate when the handsome Ishida approached her, later she would say, I've never met such a sexy man. Their lovemaking bouts were legendary, often lasting for days. Regardless of Ishida's plans, Sada fell in love with him, possibly for the first time in her life. Being her lover was not enough for her. Sada became more despondent when Ishida moved away from her and started drinking heavily. Inspired by a play she had seen in which a geisha threatened her lover with a knife, she Sada bought a large kitchen knife and threatened Ishida with it at her next meeting. Ishida was amused by her threats and took her to an inn in the red light district of Ogu for their next lovemaking marathon. What happened next is based mainly on Sada's testimony. After two days of lovemaking, she took off her kimono obi and began to strangle him. She found the erotic suffocation of her pleasurable and told him to do it while she slept. On the morning of May 18th, she strangled him to death, whether intentionally or not is open to debate, and she would later say that she felt a sense of clarity realizing that he was dead. After cutting off her lover's genitals, she put on her underwear and left the inn at 8 a.m. The mutilated body was found by a maid some time later and she began her search for Sada Abe. There was panic across the country over lurid media accounts depicting a deranged Sada on the run. The reported sightings came from all over Japan. Goro Omiya was caught up in the media frenzy and his relationship with Sada completely destroyed his political career. As for Sada herself, she stayed at a nearby inn and reportedly made plans to commit suicide. Following a tip, police tracked her down to her hotel room on May 20, and she immediately surrendered. Ishida's amputated genitals, still wrapped in the magazine cover, were found in her bag. The news of Sada's capture was reported throughout the country and was even announced in Japan's national diet. Given the political turmoil of the time, the bizarre sex scandal was a welcome distraction and the public swallowed every detail of the testimony she gave during her cross-examination. And the media frenzy was just beginning. During Sada Abe's eight-session interrogation, the police found her strangely convincing when she spoke about killing Kichizo Ishida. Sada was emphatic in saying that, I loved him so much, I wanted him all for myself. But since we were not husband and wife, as long as he lived he could be embraced by other women. I knew that if I killed him, no other woman could ever touch him again, so I I killed him. When she was asked why she cut off his genitals, she replied, because I couldn't take his head or his body. I wanted to take the part of him that brought back the most vivid memories. The public was fascinated with the case. While jealousy killings were not uncommon, the Lorena Bobbitt case was memorable. Sada Abe's trial began on November 25, 1936, 
and crowds gathered for hours before the court opened in order to view her, she wore a strange conical hat going in and out of the courtroom to hide her face. Eager reporters aired as much of her sensational testimony as government censors allowed, even one of the three judges who tried her case later admitted to being sexually aroused by the explicit details. Considering the conservative nature of Japanese society at the time, Sada's testimonial, which later became a bestseller, was explosive. The media frenzy did not focus only on Sada. Goro Omiya had been investigated by the police for his possible involvement in the murder, but was eventually released. He resigned from his political and academic posts and disappeared from public view. Kichizo Ishida's wife was devastated by the death of her husband, although she could hardly have been unaware that he was a ladies' man, but she managed to keep the restaurant going. Ironically, the Yoshidaya restaurant flourished thanks to the publicity of the case. Even the inn where the murder had taken place drew enthusiastic customers, many couples specifically asked about the room where Ishida had died. Any hope of a lengthy trial was dashed when Sada Abe simply pleaded guilty to the charges against her. Despite her plea, numerous witnesses, including Sada's sister, were called, and Ishida's severed genitalia were brought into evidence. It wasn't about the verdict, just the sentence she would receive. Sada awaited the death penalty so she could join Ishida while the prosecution sought a 10-year sentence. The six-year sentence he received came as a surprise to everyone in the courtroom. When handing down the sentence, the judge explained his decision by highlighting the role that Ishida had played in the events that led to his death. He also talked about Sada's mental state at the time, despite Sada's objections, her lawyer insisted that she was insane at the time of the murder. The judge concluded that the sentence would be enough time for Sada to rehabilitate himself in prison and start a new life upon his release. Since she never committed another crime, he was probably right. Sada's time in prison would represent the most stable period of her life. She would later describe the prison staff as loving, caring people, and indeed felt part of a community. Despite the setbacks, especially on the first anniversary of Ishida's death, she was able to function and even studied Buddhist philosophy while she was in prison. Because she was a model prisoner, her sentence was later commuted and she was released on November 10, 1940. Unfortunately, her notoriety kept her in the public eye for the rest of her life. Even living under an alias, Ella Sada discovered that the public fascination with her case made it impossible to start a new life. As she was released from prison without any real income, she lived with her sister and her brother-in-law for a time, but war rationing forced her to support herself. Under the name, Yoshii Masako, she went to work as a maid, but was fired from her when her employers found out her true identity. A serious man then asked her to become her lover, and she reluctantly agreed. This relationship ended after several years when her family found out who she really was. Although Sada realized that her name had become poisonous and was distraught that the public thought of her as a sexual pervert, this would change over time as post-war attitudes regarding sexuality changed. They will liberalize more. Still, there were few occupations open to her as a notorious woman who lived alone, and the stigma of her past continued to haunt her. He sued the author of a scandalous book based on alleged interviews with her, this was settled out of court, and even published her own autobiography in 1948. After years of living in semi-anonymity and working in pubs and restaurants, Sada finally managed to disappear. Last seen in 1970, nothing else is known about her life. Despite her disappearance, the fascination with Sada's case really ended. Her life has been the subject of non-fiction books, novels, psychoanalytic essays, and movies. The 1976 erotic classic, Realm of the Senses, is probably the best known of the three films made about Sada's life. The film's explicit sex scenes, and its gruesome ending, caused it to be banned or censored in countries around the world, but it presented viewers with a bizarre case that is still largely unknown outside of Japan. 
Whether Sada Abe is a feminist icon or a notorious murderer, and has been described as both, her case represents important evidence of the changing sexual mores of Japanese culture. Whatever the final destination of her. So much for today's episode, subscribe and give like if you liked it. See you in the next episode of La Criminotica.